for uh, all uh, biblical scholars who are interested in the in the historical Jesus, which is a field that's now almost 300 years old, um, is that outside of the New Testament text, uh, he's not found in first century texts about Judea and Galilee, except for this uh, paragraph called the Testimonium Flavianum, which almost everybody at least considers to be uh, not an original text. It's been at least tampered with. It's not completely added afterwards. So this has been the problem for, for everyone working on historical Jesus studies. He's not there outside of the New Testament text. And this has led to two predominant um, ideas of the historical Jesus. Uh, and the, the prevalent one, the mainstream one, is that Jesus existed as a person, but he was much less known in his own time than what the Gospels portray him to be. I mean, the Gospels portray him as a person who's very, very prominent with, you know, all the dignitaries of, of, of the empire being present during his trial. So, so that is the, the, the predominant theory that he, he was there, but he was, you know, one of the many uh, messianic figures during that first century. The, the, the less common conclusion is that he, he's a mythical character. He never existed at all. So I did what everybody has done, you know, comparing uh, the New Testament with uh, Josephus mainly, but all the, uh, the uh, historical text narratives from that period. Josephus is the most important one because it really covers the, uh, the era in, in detail. If we take away Josephus, we know nothing about what happened in, in Judea and Galilee during the Roman occupation and during the Jewish war. Uh, nobody claims Josephus is always, he exaggerates. Yeah. But if we don't, if we dismiss him, we have nothing. There was really almost nothing uh, in the 30s uh, when, when the New Testament portrays Jesus as having been active in Josephus that would correspond to the New Testament. But there were really a number of similarities or, or very uh, analogous events. So uh, I started noticing this uh, and, and I just put it aside because it didn't fit because it was in, the, in a different era. It was not in the 30s. Most of these similarities were in the late 40s and 50s. And, and there were some very, very clear ones. I mean, for instance, uh, there is a person described in, in the Acts of the Apostles of the New Testament who's called Theodos. And, and he's, he's talked about as being dead already when the apostles are brought to the Jewish council, which is in the 30s, if you would go by the chronology of the New Testament. But Theodos was a very well-known uh, messianic leader, and Josephus says he died between 44 and 46. So that, that's a very clear, you know, chronological aberration. There are other ones. Um, when I did, a, I, I did a complete study of Josephus' mention of everything that has to do with robbers, right. um, all through his text, all of them, and robbers... Um, in Josephus's text, are rebels, Jewish rebels. Right. Now, robbers are very prevalent in the in the gospel text. Jesus is is uh, crucified between two robbers. Barabbas was a robber. Uh, when he is uh, arrested, he says, "You're coming towards me as if I were a robber." I mean, robbers, and it there, it's also says in the text that there was an insurrection going on at the time. Mark says, and Luke also, that there was an insurrection happening. Now, none of this is visible in Josephus. He doesn't mention, I mean, he mentions robbers a lot, right. but he stops mentioning them at 6 CE, and he starts again at 44. But in the period when Jesus is active, there are no robbers mentioned at all. And furthermore, Tacitus says that this was the period of Tiberius was a period of quiet and peace. First of 
of all, the use of, uh, of the term robbers, which is, which is uh, Jusitus' most common term for the rebels. There are others. Zalot is one, Sikari is one, uh, and then there are a number of uh, terms in Hebrew and Aramaic also. But robbers, or lestai, uh, is his most common term. And, and, and really, they are there during the Roman occupation. What Josephus writes is that the organized form of the Jewish rebellion started with Judas the Galilean and the revolt against the, the tax, the, what, which also um, uh, Luke writes about the, the census under Quirinius, which was a census for tax purposes. And this sparked the first, as Josephus describes it, the first organized revolt by the Jews against the Romans. Before I even started thinking of a time shift, although I started seeing all these chronological aberrations, before I even got that far, I, I noticed that there, was, there were a lot of similarities between this guy called the Egyptian or the Egyptian prophet, which is, you have to also keep in mind that Josephus names only about six or seven uh, messianic pretenders during the first century, and the Egyptian is one of them. He's not a small guy, he's an important guy, as is Theodos. He writes about the Egyptian in both his major works. He writes about him in uh, the Jewish War and also in Jewish Antiquities. And I'll just read one of them because they're very similar to each other. So uh, this is the one in Antiquities. There came out of Egypt about this time to Jerusalem one that said he was a prophet and advised the multitude of the common people to go along with him to the Mount of Olives, as it was called, which lay over against the city and at the distance of five furlongs. He said further that he would show them from hence how, at his command, the walls of Jerusalem would fall down. And he promised them that he would procure them an entrance into the city through those walls when they were fallen down. Now, when Felix, Felix was the procurator, okay, the Roman procurator. Now, when Felix was informed of these things, he ordered his soldiers to take their weapons and came against them with a great number of horsemen and footmen from Jerusalem and attacked the Egyptian and the people that were with him. He also slew 400 of them and took 200 alive. But the Egyptian himself escaped out of the fight but did not appear anymore. Now, in the... The other one in, in the Jewish war is more negative. Uh, and he also mentions that he had spent time in the wilderness before coming to, to Jerusalem. Now, I immediately thought, wow, that's weird. He, he, the Mount of Olives, you know, the setting, this is where Jesus, not where he preached first to, uh, to his uh, disciples and where he was arrested was the Mount of Olives. Late one night, and it was really late, it must have been like three o'clock in the morning. I'm sitting and I'm reading the uh, Greek original, or rather, or rather the English next to the Greek of, of John, and of the description of how Jesus is arrested. Now, the Synoptic Gospels, they just say that the, the Jewish council arrested him. But in John, it says that the, the men from the Jewish council were accompanied by the Speda and the Filiarchos. And that is translated as the band and the captain, or uh, in some places, the officer and his men. Different, you know, it sounds like they brought a few little guys, soldiers with little little guys. But when you go to the original, Speda and Filiarchos, Speda is a Roman cohort of 1,000 soldiers nominally, usually between 600 and 1,000 soldiers. And the Chiliarchus means commander of 1,000. So there was a battle. There's no way one resting man is lying there on the Mount of Olives and 1,000 soldiers come just to arrest him. And, and this is also strengthened by the fact that Luke tells, in, according to Luke, Jesus tells the disciples to bring swords up to the Mount of Olives. 
after the last supper. That was the first similarity. The second one, this whole association with Egypt, and it's not only Matthew. I mean, all the, not all, but a number of the uh, non-Christian and also some of the Christian later descriptions of, of Jesus says that he, you know, Celsus being perhaps the most prominent one, says that Jesus spent time in Egypt as an adult, not just as a child, which Matthew said. So that's the second one. The third one is the wilderness. Now, the wilderness, of course, a lot of the Messianic leaders, the ones we know about, spend time in the wilderness. But then you also have this prophecy of tearing down the walls of Jerusalem. Now, Jesus did that too. So when I read this, it was it was actually quite, it was a shocking experience for me because it was, you know, it was, it was as if it really was like the floorboards opened up and, and history came rushing up towards me. It was quite freaky, actually. When Jesus is crucified, there is another guy who's being let go. And this guy is a rebel leader. And his name is Barabbas. And according to Matthew, his full name is Jesus Barabbas. And this guy is not crucified. And what does Barabbas mean? Barabbas means son of the father. So the guy who is not crucified when Jesus is crucified is Jesus, son of the father. And so this is not a, a new idea that they are the same person. This has been, you know, I've seen papers from the 30s on this, that, that Jesus Barabbas and Jesus uh, of Nazareth must be the same person. But the interpretation of, of why, you know, one is crucified and one isn't, have varied. And, and there are a lot of different suggestions there. But at least this is something that's interesting to, to bring up when you look upon the one remaining difference, I would say, between Jesus and the Egyptian. If you look at the whole thing with the Egyptian, and Theodos also, uh, it's, not only, it's not only that uh, there are so many similarities to the actual events of Jesus' final weeks and his arrest, it's also that you have all these other uh, events that happened at the same time, which seemed to be shifted. You know, I mentioned robbers. You have this, the Galilean-Samaritan conflict. You have somebody named Stephen, Stephanos, who is also attacked by a Jewish mob outside the walls of Jerusalem. You have, you have so many different things. that think you have similarities that are greater between Felix and the, uh, uh, the pilot of the Gospels then between the pilot of the Gospels and the pilot of, of Josephus. Like, for instance, they say uh, uh, the pilot slaughtered Galileans, it says in the, in the Gospels. Pilot wasn't even the, the, the ruler of Galilee. I mean, it's, it's packed with, with uh, things that don't fit with the 30s, but fit very, very well with the late 40s and the 50s. So it's a whole system. And I haven't seen those other people, whether they put them in Hasmonean times or during the war, I haven't seen them put a whole package of text and individuals from, from the New Testament that, that seems to be like wholesale moves, wholesale moves to another era. Um, I, 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 just to complicate matters a little bit, I just want to point out, however, that although the stories of Jesus himself seem to be very similar to the descriptions that you find in the late 40s and 50s in Josephus. There are events described in the New Testament which I would place during other rebellion-related events of, of Josephus, one of them being the, the time of birth of Jesus. This is, this is really quite, you know, if you think of it. First of all, Luke puts the birth of Jesus 10 years at least later than Matthew does. Matthew puts it before Herod the Great died, and he died 4 BC or BCE. Uh, 
Luke puts it at the time of the tax census of Quirinius, which is 6 CE. That's the first strange thing. The second strange thing is he puts it at the time of the tax census of Quirinius without writing that this sparked the Jewish rebellion. So, so instead of writing that it's the birth of the Jewish rebellion, he writes that it's the birth of Jesus. So, so here you have one of those very typical that I that I say in my book. It's subtext. It's the subtext of the rebellion. The rebellion isn't mentioned. It's in subtext. But the events of the rebellion are all there. And so uh, Luke, in particular, Luke and Acts, which is probably the same author uh, who wrote both, manages to mention all the major rebel leaders. Of the first century. They mentioned Judas the Galilean, they mentioned Theodos, they mentioned the Egyptian, and they mentioned Manaen, who's probably Menahem, which is the Greek uh, word for Menahem. So they mention all of them. And there are events, the more I sort of compared uh, Josephus with the New Testament, I found more and more analogies to the actual war itself. So it's not only the 40s and 50s, but what I see in the New Testament is two layers, two very clear layers. The top layer is a, is a literary text uh, describing, you know, full of uh, mythical allusions to the Old Testament. It's a religious text um, with supernatural phenomena in it. It's, a re- it's, it's very much a religious tale of a, of a, of a peaceful messianic leader. But if you look underneath the layer, and this is the, the sort of the subtext, the, 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 the stream undercurrent of the whole New Testament, I see it as very much the same kind of book as Josephus wrote, namely a book of the Jewish rebellion against Rome, with stressing the period of Jesus, which I would suggest is the same person as the Egyptian, but not only describing that period. And and you have to also keep in mind that the 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 last uh, uh, messianic leader named by Josephus before the Egyptian is Theodos. And what does Theodos do? Theodos amasses his followers by the River Jordan, and then he's captured by the authorities and decapitated. And how <laughs> how much more similar to, to John the Baptist can you get? Beginning with Paul, or definitely with, uh, if you look at the period that follows the Jewish war, it is a complete catastrophe. It's the end of the world for them, for this, for the for the Jewish people. It there was, I think, a, a change of attitude. The formative years were very different, I believe, from what later became the new religion. Whereas the formative years were years that were very much enmeshed with what everybody did in those days. All the messianic leaders were rebellion, were rebel leaders. That was, they, it, it, they were ne- never just one or the other. The, the, the rebel leaders were messianic leaders and definitely the other way around. The messianic leaders were rebel leaders. But after the, you know, after it, it was a catastrophe, complete. I mean, it was, it was the end of the world. And there, and here is the seed of a new religion. Um, and it, it was no longer a violent religion. It was a religion that had a new attitude to life, that had a more peaceful attitude to life. But at the same time as the text was to present the, the, the context of how this religion came about and the, the sort of the nativity story of the religion, if you want to put it that way. 
It also wanted to tell the truth of its origins. I believe that was the reason. And so they put it in, they put it in subtext. But uh, they couldn't, I mean, if they wanted to, to maintain the new philosophy and the new attitude and the new look upon life, then they, they had to, to change the characters involved in the, in the birth of the religion into something else than perhaps what they were. And so they, they moved it. And they, and they, I mean, they moved, I mean, what they had to do after, especially after reading Josephus, I guess, because Josephus portrays the Egyptian as not a very, you know, he, it's not a sympathetic picture of the, of, of the Egyptian. That they, they, they had to, in order to, to maintain the new philosophy, they had to move it to another era uh, where there was no Jesus where there was no character that could compete with the image that they portray. So if you leave it where it was in the 50s, then everybody can sit and read Josephus and compare it and see that the Egyptian was a a rebel leader. And the interesting thing is that according to Ax, he was a Sikari leader. He was a, he, he, Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament says that the Egyptian was a leader of 4,000 Sicarii, and Sicarii were the most violent of the rebels. So, so the, in order not to have competing narratives, they had to move it to an era where there were no competing narratives. And, and the price they paid was that Jesus became an ahistorical person. 